How does this sound as a compliment? A man of integrity, a man of great judgment, and a man who knows the law. That's how President George Bush described John Ashcroft, a man he nominated to serve as U.S. Attorney General. He's also called the architect of the Patriot Act. And it's a pleasure to welcome back to the 700 Club a dear friend of many years, former Attorney General John Ashcroft. John, good to have you with us today. Thank you. Pat, it's always great to be with you, and I thank you for your ministry and what you mean to America. Um, Keep telling the truth and keep yeah. calling it like it is. I'll do it. It isn't always easy, John. You know that. Hey, let me ask you on that, that Patriot Act. What, we, did Sensenbrenner write that or did you write it or you worked it together? How did you get it crafted? Oh. <clears throat> uh, really, 9-11, uh, the tragedy occurred on Tuesday and by Saturday, members of the department had put together a collection of, uh, of law enforcement authorities that existed for variety of criminal activities but didn't apply to terrorism and that's basically what the Patriot Act was it was sweeping tested and tried law enforcement capacities and putting them into a law that would also make those available in the war on terror we had previously had an underpopulated toolkit when it came to fighting terror and we needed to have every tool that was available against organized crime for example uh, against and drug dealers, for example, against the terrorists as well. And that's what the, the Patriot Act did. And that was ready by about Saturday. Uh, the Congress debated it for about 60 days appropriately, but enacted it and has reenacted it on several occasions since. You broke up, I think, 130 some terrorist plots while you were Attorney General. Is that the right number? Oh, uh, the numbers are over 100. Yeah. and um, various efforts that were made to uh, uh, really destroy the freedom which we enjoy in America. Uh, freedom is an affront to people who want to control other people. Uh, the, the core value of America is liberty and people living with the capacity and uh, developing their own sets of controls, at least locally, if not necessarily personally and only when really necessary at the national level. And some uh, societies don't believe that people ought to be free. They don't believe women ought to be free to have an education. They don't believe, believe that people ought to be free to worship as they please. And they want to impose their beliefs on others. And those are the people who sought, because they couldn't convince others that their, theirs was the right way, they sought to impose it by, by terrorism. And they do that around the world. And it's unfortunate because it's at war with our core value of liberty. Have we gone too far with this NSA uh, monitoring program? It sounds extraordinarily extensive. You know, the president has substantial authority, and the case law in America indicates that that authority is based on two duties the president has. One, to defend the country in terms of national defense. The other is to conduct foreign policy. And uh, necessity defines how much the president should do and shouldn't do. And uh, I think this really means that we ought to be very careful when we elect a president as, so that we elect a person who is, is uh, reluctant to do things unless they are necessitated for the purposes of conducting the defense of the country or involving us in the right foreign policy constructs. It bothers me a little bit when necessity defines the duties in that way, if you have an administration that is very reckless about potential abuses, like uh, uh, this administration has been as it related to the IRS. If you see abuses in those areas which are more exposed, you have to worry about what happens in the areas that are more classified and more clandestine. This Friday, we've got an event at Regent University of which you are a distinguished professor having to do with hymns, not national security. You're going to be playing, singing, and instructing the students in hymns. What's that emphasis? Well, uh, there was a Scotsman who said about 300 years ago, let me write the songs of a nation, and I care not who writes its laws. <laughs> uh, the truth of the matter is, I believe that the greatness of America has come from for the American people and their character. Uh, de Tocqueville said that a couple hundred years ago now, not, not a full 200, but 
his analysis was America that our, about America was that our greatness came from the character that we have. And so much great character comes in our hymns. And I believe that if America ever is as great as it ought to be, it'll become, uh, it'll be as a revival in our churches where people are devoted to the kind of values that are expressed in our hymns. The Bible tells us that we should teach each other and admonish each other and encourage each other with hymns and spiritual songs. That, that's literally the language of scripture. And uh, hymns that have real content and hymns that reflect the nature of God, uh, the idea that they're harmonic that uh, harmony is available uh, because God is harmonic. We believe as Christians that God is triune and that uh, it's, it, it, we have this ultimate harmony and it is a design of God that we be in harmony with God. I think our music should reflect that kind of harmony and our music should be inclusive. It should welcome all kinds of people together and bind us together. And I think hymns do that. So we're on the campus of Regent University this weekend. We have uh, a hymn sing on Friday night and we have, uh, we have uh, uh, also on Saturday a seminar on the nature of hymns, the content. The hymns should be consistent with the Christian worldview, that they should be consistent with the nature of God, that they should be inclusive. And most of all, we should be obedient to scripture in teaching and admonishing other and each other and encouraging each other with hymns. I, I, it's going to be a great, great time this weekend. There was a great revival in England under the Wesleys and uh, uh, Charles Wesley wrote, I think, 6,500 hymns and some of the most magnificent music. I find some of these choruses and things that are being sung in churches don't embody the wonderful uh, uh, scripture and the expression of the worship that you've, you're talking about. Am I correct in that? Well, I, I just think that the hymns that, uh, these classic hymns are so important and they do have content. Let me give you just one example. If you take the third verse of the, one of my favorite hymns called Great is Thy Faithfulness. Mm. It says, pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside, the pardon of God pardon for sin, the peace of God, and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide the presence of God. Bright hope for today, uh, you know, that's the promise of God and uh, the power of God, all mentioned in one verse. Uh, when you load that kind of constructive understanding of God's care and concern for us into these hymns and then you sing them, it's a matter of instructing yourself and inspiring yourself to the highest and best. And that's what God calls us to as individuals, to serve and to live at our highest and best. Well, John, I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh, Friday. Uh, those in the uh, Tidewater area is going to be in the chapel, a beautiful chapel of Regent University, a hymn sing and story seminar. That's going to be November the 1st and Saturday, November the 2nd, and uh, led by a former attorney general, distinguished professor at Regent University. All the events are free, open to the public, and you can log on to cbnnews.com, and the public is welcome to this inspiring event with this great man. Isn't that wonderful? I was privileged just a few weeks ago yeah. to be around the piano singing hymns with uh, Attorney General John Ashcroft, and I had no idea that he was such a gifted uh, piano player. When I complimented on his piano playing, and he said, Oh, a lot of people can play the piano. That's not my gift. My gift is that I'm shameless. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that he's not afraid to share there, it. There was a group called the Singing Senators, and Trent Lott, who was the majority leader of the Senate, and John Ashcroft and some, some others, I forget all the rest of them, but they sang and uh, they did Elvira, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was great, you know. They had a deep bass singer. It was fun, but uh, John, is uh, he's really passionate about restoring the hymns. Uh, it doesn't matter if I can write the songs. It yeah. doesn't matter about the politics because the, the, the singing. Well, you know, in the, in the great revival, the Welsh revival, uh, oh, that can be joy for me. You know, the, and the, the singing of the Welsh revival was the thing that just transcended the, the uh, boundaries of earth. It was incredible. They are powerful. Oh, yeah. yeah. 